little bit of my project today. Um, don't have a ton of results, but just some of the methodology. So we're talking about the long-term events of painting athletic fields on soil characteristics. Um, so I'll start out with sort of how we just um, came up with how we were going to sample our fields. So we took um, four different schools in the Atlanta area, all with USGA sand-based systems, because um, we determined that we could see the paint traveling down um, in those systems rather than the native soil. Um, so we went to these schools and we mapped the fields with an EM38 ground conductivity meter and then also a TDR soil moisture meter. Um, so we went back and we made maps of all this data and while the EM38 is a great mapping tool, we don't really know what it's telling us. Um, and so we took the maps of the soil moisture meters and we took samples um, based on similar moisture readings um, just because we wanted to get all of these underlying condition, conditions um, sort of under control, like understanding, okay, um, like this is a wetter area, this is a drier area, just so we have a more uniform sample size. Looks like this uh, regions with time to grade centers of they are surrounded by dry ground margins. And these, uh, this pathogen produces spores, so it can spread uh, rapidly and destroy all the plants in the vicinity. Uh, talking about the tall fescue grass, I'm sure you might have seen some tall fescue in the morning during the field day. So tall fescue is a cool season bunch type grass which is usually um, acclimatized to uh, cooler temperatures but also uh, it is grown widely in the transition zone. Uh, it has a very, um, it is a, a very good heat tolerant grass, um, so it's thriving well in the tra uh, transition zone. It has deeper root system, so it can withstand drought. It has a good uh, foot traffic tolerance. It can adapt to different types of soil conditions, um, alkaline, acidic, uh, less fertile, and it is really a moderate maintenance. Uh, it requires moderate maintenance. So uh, it's a very ideal choice for uh, homeowners uh, for their lawns. So like a little salt meal. So we realized that we also saw that, but however, you can see that this is different from this guy. Even though they were present, you encounter the, the bumblebees more than the other groups. Um, also in the month of September, we found out that bumblebees were also still active, still utilizing this resource. We encountered them more. Um, and when we now looked at the polling load and compared what we were getting from, uh, I called it Poese because that's the family that Senti grass belongs to. So when we look at uh, what was coming on the polling load, we saw that uh, most of uh, the bees were coming from the um, poese, which is the centipede grass, compared to the one that, that's not centipede grass. We moved ahead and also we looked at um, if we could use centipede grass pollen to sustain bumblebee um, you know, development, which we did in the lab. And I'll tell you what we did was we compared this with a butterfly bush, which is a known flowering plant. And you could tell that uh, butterfly bush and centipede grass did um, pretty similar. Like the number of larvae that we found uh, also the weight of the colony and uh, you know the number of pupae we didn't see any difference comparing them and the control which means that there was no food it was just sugar water we gave to the bees but this one they had access to the pollen from butterfly bush pollen from centipede grass there was no difference here and same as um, the number of sugar that they used so basically this just shows us that this is a resource out there that could be useful to the bees um, it looks like the bumblebees are utilizing this um, a lot more and also further uh, research should be done to look at the nutritional analysis of centipede grass. Well, thank you all and I